ask that question so often about where am I going to go pray? What do you do the whole day? Let's go. I'll show you what we do. Well, good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the world's first virtual pray day. It's awesome to have your company. So what we're going to do today is head out um, into a remote area. And as I've said during the lecture, the reason to get remote is so that we can be isolated and be with the Lord and concentrate on, on praying and so on. Now, the real objective for all of us, any one of you in business, is to absolutely hear back from the Lord. It's no good just going out there and praying and praying. We need to hear from the Lord. And that's why it's so important that we can concentrate and spend the whole day out there. But that's what we're doing today. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit about the Australian bush and so on, because I always go out in the bush and pray. You might pray in your office or in your bedroom or wherever, some other quiet place in a park. But because I go out to the bush, um, I'm going to explain a few things about the Australian bush. Most of our members are going to log in from overseas, and uh, so they wouldn't know much about Australia. And the whole effort here is to try and make this lecture interesting or this session interesting to people so that they remember what we're doing, so they remember what we're trying to achieve. So if you see me talking about something in the bush and you might think, well, that's not relevant to praying, it is in two ways. A, it's relevant to people overseas and B, it's relevant because the Lord made this whole creation so beautiful and so complex and the only reason He did that, the only possible reason He could have done that is for us. There's nothing else. There's no other living organism that can understand that or grasp that. So I spend a lot of time understanding the bush and learning the bush and learning the intimacy, the symbiotic relationships between plants and animals and so on to appreciate what the Lord has made for us. And that's all part of intimacy with the Lord. When you can get out and thank Him for the awesome stuff that He's made, it's all part of praying for a whole pray day. So I'll show you bits and pieces and you just link them all together and join all the dots. Um, just a bit of a description about the area. Uh, we live here on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, Australia. Um, and this is a, a strip of about 10 kilometers wide, uh, four cities, quite small cities with a combined population of about 300,000 people. Uh, to the east, we have the Coral Sea, just behind these trees here. And uh, to the left, uh, to our west, we have the Great Dividing Range, and then behind that is just the rest of Australia, miles and miles, there's a bit of farmland and then there's nothing for thousands of kilometers. So it's a perfect place for people like me, like to live with some cities to do business, but you've got the bush on the ocean and so on. We're now heading north out of the town that we live in. We live in uh, Forest Glen. We're heading north uh, to Lake Barumba. So Lake Barumba is about 80 kilometers, 50 miles northwest of the Sunshine Coast. And we're heading there deliberately because this is a lake that has some uh, nice mountains around it, beautiful mountains, and they block out all of the modern technology. There's no phone signal, there's no WhatsApp, there's no Facebook out there, there's nothing. And that's the whole objective. We want to get out of that place, uh, out of the, uh, uh, any disturbances. We don't want to be able to read an email and, and be distracted from our praying. Um, so that's why I like to go to a, a remote place. Uh, it's going to take us about 40 minutes to get there and then once we get there I'll show you the lake and I'll show, uh, we'll discuss the whole environment when we get there. journey northwest we come across the small timber town of Imbil settled in the 1890s and supported by a timber mill Imbil has a population of just over 900 and it's so typical of small Queensland country towns you know dominated by a hotel a pub and a grocery store it certainly doesn't take long to get through Imbil and then we swing southwest and cross the beautiful Yabba Creek for the first of six low-level crossings on our way to Barumba Dam Yabba Creek meanders from Barumba Dam Wall down into the much bigger Mary River and the whole town and so on are all situated in the Mary River Valley. Yabba Creek flows all year round and is actually one of the primary inflows into Barumba Dam itself. As we approach the Barumba Dam Wall we wind our way through the hoop pine forests that feed the timber mills of Imbal. Last we 
arrive at Lake Barumba here at the dam wall. And isn't it just beautiful? It's an awesome, awesome place. This dam was completed in 1963. It's not a huge uh, dam, it's about 46,000 megalitres. The dam wall is about uh, just over a thousand feet long and the lake backs up to about 1,200 acres of land coverage. It's a pretty short journey over to the boat ramp and um, launching and recovering the jet ski is pretty well easily handled by one person. This lake is narrow and very, very deep. It's one of the deepest lakes in the entire country. It's teeming with fish and wildlife. There's wallabies, there's kangaroos, there's just herds and herds of deer. There are brumbies or wild horses. Um, there are wild pig. There's just about every animal that you can think of that's native to this country or feral to this country for that matter. And incredible bird life uh, that they're all abundant in these hills and on the lake shore. I come here because of the natural isolation from the phone and internet signals. Uh, you see the mountains that surround the lake, they block out everything. And that gives me the privacy that I want and the privacy that you're going to need for your prey day. Uh, I run a large corporation, as you know, and the phone never stops. So out here, I'm, although quite close to home, I'm completely isolated from all of modern technology. Now you remember uh, after we left the little town of Imbal we crossed Yabba Creek six times and I mentioned it was one of the main inflows into this lake. Well our journey to my remote praying camp will take us by jet ski across the entire lake and eventually we will locate the mouth of Yabba Creek as it heads into the lake and then we'll head right up into the very headwaters of that same Yabba Creek. Uh, the journey on the jet ski across the lake and up the river is really a time to sit back and enjoy the utter beauty of what God has created and in my mind it's a time to acknowledge him and to thank him because as I said in the car he created this awesome world for us to enjoy that's why he created it and so we should admire it and we should look after it and we should acknowledge God for it so let's just sit back and enjoy the journey and enjoy the majesty of the stunning vista As Yabba Creek becomes narrower and narrower, the shallow water restricts other boats from reaching these quiet backwaters. The ski is very, or has a very shallow draft and can negotiate waters that are about six inches or 150 mil deep and even shallower. On one side of the creek is state forest and on the other side is a cattle property. Wild deer and wild pig come down out of the state forest and they actually eat the grass which the farmers want for their cattle. So the farmers hunt these feral animals. The easiest way for them to shoot the feral animals is for them to wait for the animals to drink at the water's edge in the evening. But fishing boats chase the animals away, so the farmers actually blockade the river with fallen logs. 
I just squeeze the jet ski through these barricades and sneak up here quietly without disturbing the farmers or their prey. But I often encounter dead deer and dead pig floating down the river full of bullet holes. Finally, after about an hour and a half of leaving home, we enter a nice broad water and there ahead of me is my beautiful remote campsite where we can set up camp and get settled down to pray for the rest of the day. Okay, that said, it's time to get back to the camp and set up the camp. Now this, all of this is only about 50 meters away. So let's go and set up camp for the day. These two little items will actually astound you. This, this is a hammock that's going to get slung up between these two trees. It's got a mosquito net on it. You know, when you pray a lot, in the, the whole day you get pretty tired. And you can start falling asleep. It's so awesome to lie in a hammock. It's cool. The breeze comes under you. No mozzies can eat you here. Now, you're not going to believe it, but this little thing, as you can see, that's the size of it, the size of my hand. This is an awesome bed. This is a blow-up bed, especially skeletally designed. It's a hiker's bed, as is this a hiker's thing. So I'm going to set them up and then you can have a good look at them. Alright, so this is that blower bed that I mentioned, the skeletal one. And you'll see how quick it is to blow it up. It's got no end. So that's as much air as I need to put in with my lungs. And now there's this little chipopo. And that just makes it a bit harder. And believe it or not, that is so comfortable. It just, it just supports all the points that need to be supported. And I'm just going to stick it in here because later on in the day, it's going to be a nice view to just lie down and have a rest. So I've deliberately made the left hand side a little bit higher like to sleep head up or lie down head up. And there's that little baby. Remember all of this came in those two little pouches. There it is. Hello for the ancient head. Rest your old head. It's a bit sunny now but I normally just fling a little, a little uh, camouflage shade that I'll throw over it when I get in. But I'll just show you now while we're doing it. Quick and easy. You go in with your behind first, followed with feet and so on. Get up here and zip her up. And how's that, man? Tell me this is not a proper prey day, eh? Awesome. So, this is the camp set up. You've just watched me set it up in record time, but uh, it's not a big job. It's quite easy to set it all up. So I'll just walk you through it because everyone's going to pray differently. Um, my recommendation is you really get comfortable because it's a long day. Praying for a whole day is hard work and uh, we need, we're here to learn as well. So you might as well be comfortable. You might as well be in the shade. You know, we didn't have to walk far. It wasn't a hard effort. It's quite easy. So those of you that love the bush, this is going to work for you. 
Um, those of you that are more coke and buns people who like to stay in the office or whatever, you'll have your own prayer closets, your own style. Um, but, you know, a lot of politicians, a lot of high achievers, a lot of significant business people, a lot of people in the marketplace are now praying, taking a whole day, some are taking two half days every week to go and pray and hear from the Lord. And they all tell me they get really comfortable. So this is a comfortable little camp. I'm only here for the day. Uh, I'm not going to spend the night, but often I do. So I often go out, I'll spend one night, maybe even two or three nights out and really get close to the Lord. So here on the right, this little tiny table, it fits into a small little bag, it's collapsible. This is all hiking equipment. You can see their kettle, that's my little kitchen, milk and tea and coffee and so on. These are actually soft air skis, they go in the, in the uh, jet ski. I'll take you over there and explain the ski in a minute. Um, this is uh, an awesome Spanish knife that I carry. I make sure that I'm well uh, armed in the bush with what you can legally carry because there's all sorts of reasons why you need to be armed here. For example, this uh, is a slingshot, okay, homemade um, at home, and we grew up with these as kids in Africa. And I can live off this for weeks and weeks. I can kill whatever I want with it. But in this particular place, there are some wild bulls that come, because even though this is state land, there is a lease here, a cattle lease, and a farmer has a lease. He lives on the other side of the river. I've met him and had a big chat to him. He's been trying to shoot this big black bull for a long time. Um, anyway, it often comes here near my camp and it brings cows with it. But as soon as it looks, sees me, it puts its head down and wants to charge, that's when I shoot it straight on the snout and it runs away bellowing. These things are evil. Come, I'll show you how this thing shoots. So I'll just show you how to shoot this thing uh, because this is what I use for... Uh, sometimes there's bulls here and they are aggressive, especially there's a black one. He puts his head down, he wants to charge, so I shoot them on the nose. And I told the farmer and he said he, he wants it killed because it, it upsets all the other cows. So this little thing is quite deadly, believe it or not. But look here, I'll shoot that tin in the tree there. Okay, so the next thing that I have, this is a phone, uh, but as I said to you, there's no phone signal deliberately. All these mountains around here keep the signal out. But on here is the most incredible bird program. And I love the bush, I love all the birds, I like to know which bird is which. And sometimes I call the bird, if I hear a bird and I don't know what it is, I press it, I, I copy it on here and call the bird in. Which the twitchers won't like, but I don't care, I want to know what it is. So that's why I carry this little phone. Communion, ladies and gentlemen, this is red wine. Here's some uh, bickies for the bread. Uh, I take communion every single day of my life. I want to re-establish with the Lord that I serve Him. I want to remember what He did for us. So, you know, the bread, if you take it in the context of the marketplace, you take it in the context of your assignment, doing your assignment and so on, Jesus' assignment, what He physically did on the ground, okay, uh, was to defeat corruption. Remember first century Palestine, you'll know this from other lectures that I've done. First century Palestine was an absolute basket case with the Jewish nation starving to death because of their corrupt leaders, corrupt politicians and corrupt priests. The very first thing Jesus does is he comes and starts to break the corruption by getting the tax collectors saved, break the chain of corruption, uh, getting them saved. And then he starts for healing people for free and sending them to the temple and saying, look you priests, I healed for free, I didn't charge, they were charging thousands and so on and so on. And so that meant that Jesus had to live a righteous life. So there was no corruption in him, no sin in him. We know that. So when we take the bread as business people or marketplace people, we're taking it to say, Lord, I'm taking your body that never sinned into my body. The root word for bread is lachan, and it means to overcome. It actually means to overcome it, and, and, and in our case, overcome the evil of corruption and greed and self-centeredness. So that's why we take the bread. Uh, well, that's in the marketplace context. And then here we have the, the representation of the blood, the wine. Now, again, in a marketplace connotation, there's lots of church versions, but in the marketplace, this signifies that Jesus completed his assignment and created the new covenant. He, he got rid of all of that corruption, and eventually, the ultimate sacrifice, he shed his blood so that those, so that the people could, the, the veil, as you know, was torn on the temple the night that he was killed or murdered, and... As the veil was torn, the priests lost their power and the people could go straight to the Father. Okay, that was Jesus completing his assignment by shedding his blood for us. So as we take the wine and, and a good sip of good wine, uh, this is sacramental wine, white grapes grown in Israel and so on. Um, as we do that, we're acknowledging that we will continue our assignment and complete it right to the very end. Okay, so communion is important. You should do it every day. Here now... You see some beef jerky. This is a little uh, awesome little knife. 
that I use to cut the jerky, or we call it bultong from Africa. That there is made by my good friend Ryan Milne, or by his dad actually in Perth. He goes to KI in Perth, and he sends this over. Like every month or so, we get a whole bag sent out, which is awesome, Ryan, you're a legend. And uh, my kids and grandkids um, just eat it all the time, so I have to hide it to bring it out here. But that's what that is. Uh, binoculars, it's always worth having binos in the bush. These are awesome ones. I bought them at Singapore Airport. Really tiny. Everything I carry is small because I, I need to... A lot of the time I'm walking. I go walking in the bush. Sometimes I'm not here on the jet ski. Sometimes it's actually walking. Okay, comfortable chair. Always, because we're going to be here for hours. And... This little table is a special one. It fits on the jet ski nicely. Um, it's deliberately, I use the one that, that has these bags, zip-up bags, because the minute I leave this camp, the bandicoots are going to come at last light, the legget, the goannas are going to come during the day, and the crows come. So I put all my food in there and zip it up, and they haven't figured out how to open that yet. But they are here. They are a pest. I don't want to hurt them, but I'm happy to lock it all up that way. Here's the computer. This is the Bible. Okay, crucial. So this is a little beauty. It's going to last all day. The batteries are not going to go flat. But gone are the days when we're carrying big books in the bush. So with this one, I'm using eSword. Okay, and I really recommend that everybody gets eSword. All right, it's free. It's a, it's a free uh, program. You can download it. There's lots of uh, um, Bible versions, lots of commentaries, um, all sorts of stuff that goes with it. And you can really learn the background of what the author of the scripture is saying. Uh, when you want to uh, add to it, add to your commentaries, or add to your Bible versions, you can buy different ones. In my opinion, they're worth buying. It's always worth paying for stuff, guys. You know, people are doing this for nothing. They need to eat. We don't want them to go broke. We want them there. So use the freebie, but then add to it and pay for it. Come, let me show you my jet ski, because this is the vehicle to get here. So this is the jet ski that I use. This is a Yamaha um, Wave Runner. It's an FXHO Cruiser. This is an awesome machine, ultra reliable. You can put thousands of hours on these. It's a huge four-stroke, 1.8 litre, 1,830 cc's. Um, and you can put enough uh, supplies and fresh water and firewood to go out offshore for three days and three nights on this beast. You can see everything in this camp that's come off it, and we, this is only for one day. We can really stack this up. Excellent for fishing off, excellent for spear fishing off, excellent for playing in the waves. It's just amazing. Okay, so these here are what's called tubbies. These are made by a friend of mine, Geordie, good bloke down at um, Shoreline on, in Springwood in Queensland here, just south of Brisbane. They are brilliant. South Africans, of course. Where does a good gear come from? Okay, and these are, these are the uh, holds. So inside there is everything you saw in that camp. That's where it came from. It all fits in there. And, and you can put your spear guns and everything else in there as well. These here are actually tackle boxes, but I've got sunscreen, diving knives, and so on in there. These are obviously for your fishing rods. Um, you can troll off these. These are adjustable. They go in and out. They come off. Uh, this is I use this for fresh water, but typically you would carry all of your um, uh, safety gear, your flares and all that sort of stuff in there. My flares are in there. That one over there, you can turn that, that valve on and off and it becomes a fresh water bait tank because the jet ski pumps water into there, gets aerated and bubbles out over the top. Obviously on the other side there's another tubby. These guys have a patented latch system where you just take the tubby off. They say it's a two-man job. It's not. It's a one-man job. I do it on my own all the time, so it's quite easy. Um, the beauty of the jet ski, not only is it a rocket ship and goes like the clappers, um, it only has a very, very shallow draft. So you can go for a long way, like up this creek. This is Yabba Creek. Okay, and sometimes I go up there and I camp further up, right upstream. There's some nice shady spots up there. And uh, uh, no boats can get there because there's only a skinny draft to get over a very shallow causeway, and then it gets deep again. These little babies, they can go over that, and that's part of the beauty of them. It's very stable. You know, it's a great big 360-kilo machine but it's actually a rocket ship. The range of this, well over 200 kilometers. Um, that's, of course, if you're sitting around about 40 or 50 kilometers per hour. Um, and top speed, we've added up to 114 kilometers an hour. Um, so for you Americans and people who live in strange parts of the world that don't understand the metric system, which is the only system that makes sense, it's about 65 miles an hour, something like that. And when you're this far off the water, less than a meter off the water, that's a rocket. It's going pretty quick. So there you have it. That's my jet ski. This in the front. Uh, there's plenty of gear in there. I've got 10 litres of fresh water, all the anchor equipment and so on. Um, there's another, under the seat, there's another hold. 
and right at the back there's another hold again. This is a watertight hold here. This is where your telephone and car keys and so on goes. And this here is a, a, a depth finder and a GPS that I've had put on. And quite often I'm miles away from anywhere and uh, this helps you get back. Because sometimes I'm so far offshore you can't actually see this, the, the land. So this helps us get home. Okay, there you have it. Yamaha jet ski for prey days. <laughs>